Well, I thought I would uh, just start by reading something very briefly. This is a, a senior policymaker in a country who said in 2011, uh, for too long, tax reforms have been approached ad hoc without regard to their effects on the evolution of the tax structure as a whole. As a result, many parts of our tax system seem to lack a rational basis. Conflicting objectives are pursued at random, and even particular objectives are pursued in contradictory ways. Okay, which country do you think that is? UK and the United States. The UK, actually that's a quote from a UK policymaker, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, but it could actually apply as much to the United States. So I read that quotation out because I think, I think we're all agreed that uh, perhaps even, not, even the Nordic countries have the perfect tax system, and this is a major area of policy, um, particularly for our concern, which is the developing countries. But also the tax system you get is a, is a product of technocratic issues, the optimal choice of taxes, but it's also, as our speakers have very eloquently put, a choice and outcome of um, political economy and pol political factors as well. But it's also actually a product of data. Sometimes we seem to reach decisions around um, taxation on the basis of a large amount of ignorance about what we have there as a tax system. And that came out very strongly for me across all of the um, presentations. Um, I just sort of like to comment a little bit about the um, political side. I think it's, it's very interesting that the, the work of the ICTD has, has really married the, the political science perspective uh, together with the more technical economics. Because, you know, economists like me, we reach for this social contract idea. So, I, you know, I went around for a long time, you know, spouting away about social contracts. You pay your taxes, you get an effective state. And then Mick comes along with, you know, a view based on some evidence, but we don't have enough evidence, well, well, maybe it doesn't actually work in that way. And one reason it might not work is that actually we don't have a single unified taxpayer that, as Mick said, there are many different types of taxpayers out there and they each have different sets of behavior and we need to understand that behavior so much more. So that's something that's come out very important from this level of research. Moving to the kind of, the level of, tax benefit modeling. I mean, one great strength of the tax med benefit modeling is set out by UCA. And it's, it's something you see in, in the developed countries that, you know, you can really get a grasp on the political choices. And it's very important when that tax benefit modeling, the results of that are presented in the ways that the average person can understand and the average politician can understand. So that, you know, for example, when George Osborne sits down in the House of Commons having delivered a tax decision, the Institute of Fiscal Affairs, or Fiscal Studies in the UK, can at least give you some sense of what that means for the different strata across society. And that's important not just in a technocratic sense, it's also important um, as a democratic um, tool. Now, there are two further points I'm gonna make. One is on macroeconomics and one is on aid. And the macroeconomic point was, I was very struck by um, Liz's graph showing the slump in uh, corporate income tax revenue in South Africa. And indeed, uh, we see um, a slump in uh, tax GDP and the level of taxation um, across Africa as a whole and many developing countries around about the time of the 2009 um, financial crisis. Uh, we're now heading into Another set of macroeconomic difficulties because commodity prices are slumping. They're taking down um, the revenues that governments hoped they would have in large amounts. Uh, alternatives have to be found. Uh, governments are going to be entered into periods of stabilization. When governments enter into periods of stabilization in a Russian crisis, they rush for taxes um, that are often very regressive in terms of the poor, the easiest taxes to grab, and, and you know, you can end up in severe difficulties for poverty and social inclusion that way. And, you know, one good thing about research into policy is that we could at least help governments 
in making those tough revenue decisions at least be a bit more informed about the social consequences in a way that we weren't, say, 30 years ago when we had some of the big stabilization crises. The second thing, and this is my last point, Kari, is the role of aid and um, taxation. It's very common in a policy debate for people to say, oh, governments get ta aid revenues, therefore they don't need to tax. But equally, donor agencies have been involved in a lot of tax reform over the years and still are. The amount of technical assistance that bilateral donors have given, but also the IMF. So in some ways, it's also not surprising that tax revenues can go up simultaneously along with um, foreign aid. But it can be the case that donors tend to sometimes over-push countries towards raising the domestic tax base um, because donors also have to understand that countries have to do that in a way that's politically compatible with their own political settlement. And again, that's where we need this mix of research uh, that we've seen demonstrated today, both the politics, the economics, the data, and whatever else we've got. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start to, be, to do two mistakes. Uh, so this is data probably based on the IMF or the World Bank uh, tax GDP ratios. Uh, but it's not my data. I borrow it from Besley and Person. So. Second, I'm going to just mention, and I, I'm going to talk about an average country. Um, so uh, at the lower bottom, uh, to the left, you have these blue dots. So that's where you have the low-income countries. In the middle, we have the middle-income countries. And then far to the right, we have the high-income countries. And you see this is kind of average we call that the, let's call it an average country the the line uh, so you can see some of the poor countries are doing better than the average some are doing worse uh, um, now the the i'm coming back to the reason why we want to raise the tax gdp ratios as you can mention it uh, might be because we want to um deliver more public goods. So we need to increase the tax G GDP ratio. If you take the average country among the blue ones, so let's say they have 15% of GDP in, in revenue, and then they get 5% of aid in uh, supportion of GDP, maybe they borrow a little. So that ends up with the public sector around 25% of GDP. Now, if you want to start to achieve the sustainable development goals, um, or even the, the one we had before, the MDGs, um, we, or UN, were doing a lot of calculations on how much taxes or how much revenue do you need to reach those goals. Um, so there is this pressure now on, on the uh, poorer countries to, to um, increase uh, uh, the GDP, tax GDP ratio to, in order to achieve these goals, uh, forthcoming uh, SDGs. So how do we do that? And I think the, um, some lessons, uh, I think we got here now um, during the presentations, I worked a bit on taxation, not very much, but I think that is an excellent in initiative because if we are supposed to do some kind of advice or do analytical work, we need high quality data. And as mentioned, we don't have that, uh, we didn't have that before. So I think that is very good. And uh, moving on to um, uh, South Africa, I think also when you have that type of registered data, that also enables us to do this kind of analysis, which is very important. Uh, because one way to increase your revenue, or I mean, there are two things you need to do. You need to expand your base. That is, make sure that you have GDP growth. And then you have the rates. Uh, but we know the rates, we are, uh, I think the kind of consensus among development economists is not to raise the rates, the rates too much, but more of a, a broadening of including uh, more uh, of those that doesn't pay today. So I'll keep the system simple, but bring in those that are supposed to pay. So that would mean that we could probably move up a bit here, but in the end, it's, it's very much also the, <laughs> the base that will determine how far you can go. Uh, and I, I think the project uh, Jukka mentioned and all the, uh, the presentations here uh, gives a very um, 
a lot of interesting uh, uh, thoughts on, on how to improve the capacity and the analysis in order to push uh, those countries. Uh, you could pu perhaps push them a bit up, up, but then you have to move uh, along the trend. Uh, but we also we don't have to f we 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 should not forget the the growth side, and I just want to to conclude. Uh, this is a, another a data scary uh, graph. Um, so we have three countries. So um, I can say the blue one. Oh, sorry, the green one is Tanzania. The red one is Kenya, and the blue one is. Uh, not very clear. Uh, it's um, Sweden. Um, my point here, I think this is the data from the Madison database. The average tax rate of Sweden, that uh, was, you know, okay, Kenya is around 25%, well, but we were quite rich before we reached that 25%. This series we at the um, left we are in 1880 and then you have 100 points so you end up in 1980 um, so i just want to final caveat here about this trade-off between taxation and growth uh, i think that is something one need also to uh, think about thank you And uh, before giving, uh, if, before going to discussions, I would uh, questions. I would ask uh, the you from the floor to keep your discussion uh, questions very succinct and, and short. So please direct questions and not long statements. So please, over there. Um, very quick question, both to Alex and to Mick. Um, you both made us a strong point of the fact that the, the new data will be used to interrogate the situation in extractive industries and their taxation. Neither of you mentioned the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. Um, I, I found when, in the countries where I've worked in mining that uh, that has been a very valuable source to check on the, the quality and the content of administrative tax data. Um, do, do, you not, do you not think that that is a good source? Or do you have some suspicions and doubts about the usefulness of the um, EITI data in those countries that uh, have signed on for that uh, initiative. Let's take a second question and then we come back to answers. Oh, Hanna. I'm Hanna Rinkina from the Finnish Foreign Ministry. I would like to have your view on the global uh, UN tax body that Professor Stiglitz so forcefully defend it this morning. Thank you. Okay. Answers? Do you want to comment? There was a question, I think, directed to Mick and Alex directly. And then the second. Anybody? Uh, <coughs> oh, sorry. The, the EITI. Um, I don't want to be rude, but I'm going to be. Um, but, I think I share what is probably a consensus view, um, at least on the civil society side, that the main value of the AITI to date has been in the mobilization of civil society rather than the data that's been generated. But in terms of the actual data, there's two things. One is that I think in general, countries that are signed up to the ITI are also generating um, better data. So there's less likely to be, you know, in a sense, because of the valuable role it plays, there's less likely to be value in checking it or having it fill in gaps. But the other thing is, you know, the ITI, to its great credit, is now in a process of understanding the limitations of what it has asked for previously, and moving, I think, possibly in the next couple of years towards a mandatory uh, format of data. And, you know, what the data has always missed is a denominator. So you've had revenues without the, uh, without necessarily having the right denominator to put that against, which really kind of undermines the, on the corporate accountability side, the value of it. So I think you know it had a role, but it's more indirect, perhaps. Um, on the UN tax body, uh, Hannah, I think we've we've had that conversation. I worry about how much energy has been. 
put into that when I think there may be other winds more easily available and I worry about getting a body which is insufficiently resourced actually to do a great deal but takes a lot of political energy. On the other hand, you know, the, the fact that what the OECD is in the process of delivering in BEPS is increasingly, as we get into the, the political negotiation in the last stages, shutting out developing countries from a lot of the benefits really makes the case that the OECD just isn't fit for that particular purpose. And I think that the fact that the lobby against it being more inclusive has, has had the successes it's had in the last few months is making the case for a UN tax body increasingly hard to resist. Well, this is uh, primarily to Yuka. Uh, what you said sounded uh, extremely interesting, and I can uh, even imagine other uh, research in the tax area which could be fruitful for the future. For instance, uh, the role of presumptive taxes. Uh, there are lots of situations where it could be too difficult to, to simply compute uh, income in, in a way usable for tax authorities, and that would lead you to tax something else, which would be sort of a rough uh, measure of, of, or at least would be correlated with, with income in a, in a useful way. So that's one. And then following up on another remark, uh, it would be uh, you know, very useful to figure out what the effective uh, taxation of uh, extractive industries uh, is at the moment and how you can improve on the system by perhaps using another configuration of taxes. Thank you, Elena Perez from University of Western Cape. Uh, yeah, my question is also for Yuka. You say that um, uh, around this uh, tax benefit modeling, I was a bit puzzled. Um, you mentioned that you're using a representative household data. Um, uh, but in the case of South Africa, for example, we also hear that uh, around uh, less than 10% of the, of the households or, or the population is um, part of a, a, a tax-paying uh, uh, group. And that the top 10,000 accounted at the peak for 70% of the uh, revenue of uh, income tax. So um, if there's that uh, willingness to recognize that there's not such a thing as a representative taxpayer, how is it that we're now moving on to thinking about a representative household in, in the model? Thank you. Before giving the floor to our speakers, I would like to put one question directly to Jukka. You said, Jukka, that uh, tax and social protection arrangements should be considered as a system. But what about subsidies? In some countries, government is also subsidizing, for instance, uh, petrol prices, which is basically a subsidy to the rich. Shouldn't that be also part of the system that you mentioned? Yeah, thank you for the questions and, and, and comments. Um, uh, yes, um, the idea, certain, the idea of uh, presumption taxes is. Uh, uh, do you mean normative work or, 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 or descriptive work on the on, on, on the impacts? Because this, to some extent, the, the paper by Henry Cleven and his co-authors forthcoming in JPE is about some sort of. Uh, Presumpting taxes because it's on, 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 a, on a, in Pakistan the small firms can't escape the turnover tax. I understood that in the South African case it's a, it's a choice. The firms can choose whether they are taxed according to the turnover tax schedule or not. But but in the Pakistani case the uh, the, the tax system treats the uh, t small companies by just uh, assuming that their rate of return is something because it, it, it's based on the turnover directly. So in a, in a sense, there's, there's already some um, in a sense, descriptive work on that. But how to start normative thinking of that? I'm, I'm uh, very pleased to collaborate with somebody as clever as you on, on that topic. Because <laughs> I don't have it at the moment but great ideas on how to do that. Uh, sure, I mean, taxes on the natural sector, on the, on the mining sector, that's... Uh, that's a, that's a great topic for research. The thing is that we are a rather small institute and, 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 and we can't handle all, all the possible topics, but that's certainly something which we simply 
can't ignore when we, when we, when we talk about taxes, for example, in the African context. Um, and then I, I, I was probably, there was a question about the um, tax benefit micro simulation model and, and the use of representative um, agent. I, I think I was unclear. I, what, I, what I mentioned, what I, what I meant was that we are, we are using, a, we are planning to use survey data, which is a representative of the, of the, of the population as a whole. So it has like a, a thousands of, of households. Uh, so it's not, it's certainly not a representative um, agent model is, is, a, is, is, a, is a model which is exactly geared towards analyzing redistribution and distribution. So that's uh, obviously there are issues regarding the, uh, I mean, the data quality and, and, and especially to what extent the, the variables in the data sets which, we are, which are available actually match with the, with the tax and benefit legislation the countries have. So, and that is why we, we have already been in Engage with uh, in, in, engage in, in, an, in an analysis of, of conducting feasibility studies on, 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 on whether the idea of building a tax benefit micro simulation model for country X would make sense given the data and given what we know about the uh, uh, tax benefit um, uh, le legislation. So certainly not the representative agent. And, and Kari, you are quite right. Yes. Uh, subsidies are, uh, should be seen as a part of the system, and and actually, I mean, uh, it's a, it, it is a bit big puzzle why, for example, subsidies on things like petrol are used to that extent that they are. I mean, they are often uh, motivated by distributional concerns that the poor households spend a pro on, in proportional terms more on on some of these items which are subsidized, but they could easily be. I mean, easily and easily, but at least that you, you could you could come up with a policy where, where these subsidies would be replaced by transfers, basically, to those households which are below the poverty line. And, and removal of the subsidies while financing this, this, these transfers would still leave money to the government, which it could uh, gear to some, some other useful purposes, or then reducing other taxes. Uh, so there was an excellent talk by uh, Michael Keane from the IMF last year in an IMF in, 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 the, in, the, in, a, in a wider conference on, on, on precisely this topic and some of the political economy considerations that can ac actually affect that, that that choice. So why is it so hard to get rid of these subsidies? Right. I mean, just, just uh, uh, I mean, this is just a kind of a point of information, but in terms of, um, uh, th 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 there's an interesting thing in, in terms of South African data, that for instance, in our second last income and expenditure survey, that is the one conducted in 2005-06, uh, where there were in fact detailed questions about income tax, they, unfortunately the data wasn't presented like that in the last survey. But in that survey, the, the aggregate income tax that households thought they paid was actually half what was collected by SARS in that year. So it's quite an interesting thing. It might, might, might mean that PAYE is actually a very good tax in some senses. Um, and uh, just, but there's the other point, I mean, just in terms of discussions on the kind of the extractive industry and so on, I think it also came up in conversations that, um, that um, uh, in South Africa, there's um, something running at the moment called the Davis Tax Committee. We actually have a member here sitting here, Ingrid Willard, if anybody wants to speak. And there's been a whole series of reports on various aspects of, of uh, as they're being generated, being published, um, various aspects of the tax system. And so there has been work done on, 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 on mining and so on in that report. It has been published already. Yeah, it's published about three weeks ago or so. So anyway, yeah, just, just for interest. <laughs> Yeah, just a couple of comments on this. The first one is what is the fiscal system comprised of? Yes, it's expenditures. Yes, it's subsidies. But um, also, but don't forget tax exemptions. A very big part of the fiscal system of many countries, especially low-income countries. I'll give you an order of magnitude. I'm not sure if it's true, but it's probably right that on average in sub-Saharan Africa, Tax exemptions to investors uh, might account for about one-third of total tax raised. It's a massive figure. Um, 
The other comment I want to make on was the point about research on mining taxation. Um, yes, all in favour, but you know the reality is it is very difficult to get the data, and not so much the data on tax on the mining sector as the data on the mining economy itself and what is going on. We know there is massive transfer pricing taking place, and the figures that are actually available on the, you know on the economies of mining projects, well. The publicly available information is um, little and often uh, not very good. There is much more private information available in private databases that you can buy. So there is some, some scope, which is why I said we wanted to focus on this. There is actually some scope for hopefully extracting some of that data from private commercial databases and trying to bring it into the public domain. But I think without better data, there are plenty of economists around who'd love to do research on, on extractives because it's such a very, very big issue. Issue. Um, but they run up into, you know, into data problems very quickly. Thank you. I think we have time for two more questions. Jakko, first one, and then you. Um, I'm Jakko Kangasimi from uh, FinFan, Finnish Development Finance Institution. Um, and my uh, question and comment really relates to that. Whether, are, whether you are assuming uh, that uh, the contribution of companies uh, to public financing and financing public goods actually comes uh, through taxes, um, those registered recorded taxes. Since uh, um, uh, in, in many cases where we are involved, we actually see that not to be the case. I take two examples. First one, energy sector. Uh, in the energy uh, investments we have recently made, independent power plants, uh, producing, basically selling to the government-owned utilities and making uh, uh, very, very large contributions to public finances, but not primarily through the taxes that they pay, but uh, through the fact that the power that they produce is cheap, very much cheaper uh, than the current marginal cost of power that these government-owned uh, uh, utilities are, are these days paying uh, to the sort of emergency power suppliers uh, that that are are the, the alternative, in, in some case. If we dare to go uh, to really uh, uh, sort of uh, post-conflict places where nobody has dared to invest uh, in uh, uh, efficient energy uh, uh, investments in uh, in a, in a uh, generation, uh, the ratio could be even that. Uh, that basically. Uh, you, you could produce power at a quarter of the cost, or maybe even less than that, than what is actually currently being paid for these, these emergency arrangements that they have. Um, but that was one example. The other example comes really from the, the poorest countries and uh, from rural projects, where yes, the companies do pay taxes, actually dozens of different types of taxes and fees, uh, for all sorts of inspection and all, all, all sorts of uh, fees to various government bodies. Uh, but the real action, the real money, is what they are asked as part of their license to operate to do directly. So they are investing directly in schools, clinics, uh, 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 roads, uh, bridges, uh, uh, wells, etc. That's what they are asked to do for the local community. Uh, that's from the from the point of view of the the local people. That's bigger thing than than the, the taxes that they pay. And actually, from the finances of the company point of view, that may be the bigger money in in those directly provided uh, goods and services, rather than uh, than the the various uh, fees and taxes that they pay. Thank you. And the last question. Um, 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 my name is Imran Valodia. Um, I wonder if Mick could uh, talk uh, um, 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 a bit more about the work he's been doing on the informal economy and uh, 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 taxes. I think it's a really important issue because what what, what one usually thinks about the informal economy is that it's uh, uh, people who are trying to hide from the uh, uh, from the tax system. And for many of us who work in the informal economy, we we, we sort of t don't see anyone trying to hide. 
Uh, so it would be, it would be quite quite nice to hear what it is you're doing and whether you have any sort of measures of effective rates of tax and things of that sort. Thank you. So who would like to comment on these two questions? Um, okay, let me, th the first question first. Look, I have every sympathy with someone who's involved in the private sector sitting in these discussions and they hear tax and companies avoiding tax and it sounds as if somehow we're blaming companies for this. I don't blame companies for this. Uh, the problem of the evasion of taxes by companies big and small is a result of complex interactions between governments and companies and taxpayers. It's not the fault of any one person, it's a system. Even if uh, sometimes we campaign against companies, I think anyone understands it's a, com it's a complex system. And, you know, I have every sympathy also with companies that invest in political risky situations and they are asked by government to make direct contributions of various kinds, infrastructure, education, etc. And they do that and they say they're making their social contribution and I think very often that's true. But what we're left with in the extractive sector is a situation where in very many cases, companies are taxed on the basis of contracts that they write directly with politicians, not on the basis of tax law. Sometimes um, they are in effect exempted uh, even from filing taxes. And therefore, uh, and suggestions that somehow uh, they're evading taxes, of course you can reply, you know, well, we're making various other kinds of contributions, but how do I as a taxpayer really know what your other contributions are and whether this is equivalent to you know the taxes you should be paying so i mean you know in my view and this is not blaming companies i mean we have a very complex system but we need to shift towards a situation where extractive projects are taxed in exactly the same way as other economic activities not treated as very special because when they're treated as very special there are massive amounts of what we politely call side payments involved and you know that really needs to stop at some point um, sorry, very briefly, at Imran, let me just say, uh, we can talk later. I mean, two points about uh, informality. Um, one is, I think, especially for sub-Saharan Africa, the very interesting question for research is not so much the informal sector, but is informal taxes. And, uh, you know, a survey we've done in Sierra Leone suggests that the average rural citizen pays more in informal taxes than they actually pay informal taxes to the state. But the other point, I just want to make a point about the, the concept of the informal sector, because I think this has misled us for a long time. When I say informal sector, and possibly you say it, people think of someone who is selling cigarettes in the street or banging bits of metal in a backyard or something. From the tax tax point of view, that is not the problem. You know, these are not taxable people. The informal sector, from my point of view, is any sector of the economy where there are regular large transactions made in cash. And if you redefine the informal sector that way, um, you know, the, the informal sector is not located in small backyards. It's located in um, the offices of uh, hospitals and doctors and other professionals and many other businesses. I mean, that's what the informal sector is, large cash transactions. So... I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, I have to disagree a little bit with Mick, um, just you know, to keep in practice. Um, I, I do want to put some blame on companies. You know, I think Mick has has made very well the point that it is a complex situation always, but I've spent too long being told we just play by the rules by companies who are actively and very um, expensively lobbying to make sure the rules do not involve them either paying any more tax or being any more transparent. Um, so I think there are cases where we actually should put some blame, but it's, but it's quite specific to that. Now, in general, you know, I think the cases you raise are, are very reasonable ones, and I think it's certainly true that we lack transparency about valuable payments that are made by companies. But then I say, you know, let's step back and on balance, do we think that what we don't see involves, in general, companies paying, you know, their fair share, but not wanting to support transparency, or companies paying a bit less than that? And it's hard not to think that the second of these is more likely 
in general. So I'm certain there are companies that are, you know, paying a great deal in those social contributions in that direct way. But equally, I suspect there are a few countries, if any, where on balance that outweighs the tax that isn't being paid that should be. So I would I would take a, a slightly less uh, optimistic view of that. Just a brief comment on the, on, the, on the question on formality. I think while we have an emerging body of evidence from the Latin American context, uh, uh, much of it was cited by Santiago Levy in his talk yesterday on the impact of, of expanding social protection systems on the, form, on, on the extent of formal work. We know much, much, much uh, 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 less on the impact of, of taxes on the formal sector, on the share of the formal versus informal work. In, in, in a set of other developing countries. So, so again, this is a key margin of response uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the developing countries, but, but the body of evidence, what we, what we, what we have at the moment, is, 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 is really uh, not, not great. So more work should be done on that. Thank you. I think I will, our time is up, so I would like to thank our presenters, the, the persons, to the Tony and, and, and Jürgen, who make the, made also to the responses. I think it's obvious on the basis of what we have heard that, that we will need more data on, on taxis. It's good to hear that, that you and you wider is getting also involved in research. We have heard the commitment of wider what to deliver. We are looking forward to that. And I think also I would like to mention that not only is the tax uh, data important for the countries when they plan their, their tax policies, but also for, the, for us donors who work in some of these countries, such as, for instance, Mozambique, Tanzania, and especially in relation to the extractive products, where we're very, I think it's important to know what income there will be from these extractive products and how that income is going to be used for the government in the context of financing for development. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.